and great. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to pass it over to Ryan Morris of PVLA, who has been um, absolutely essential in the coordination of this event as well. And he will facilitate our conversation today. So thanks very much, Ryan. Take it away. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you uh, and the rest of the folks at GPCA for helping us to put this event on as well and for helping to get the word out to the greater Philadelphia arts community. Um, we're really pleased and proud to be partnering with you guys today. And we have a couple of great speakers lined up who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, but first, I just wanted to give everybody the benefit of hearing a little bit about PVLA, about the services that we offer to members of the creative community here in Philadelphia, and to give folks an idea of the ways that we can maybe assist them or their organizations uh, in what? pursuing their creative disciplines. Um, so as Tom said, I'm the executive director at Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Uh, we're a legal services nonprofit organization who for the past 40 or more years uh, actually have been assisting individual artists, arts and cultural nonprofits and creative small businesses in obtaining pro bono legal representation and consultation and uh, you know, providing additional services in the areas of advocacy and educational services as well. Um, in terms of the clients that we work with and the folks that we represent, the artistic disciplines represented in our client population, we work with folks from, from every creative discipline under the sun. I mean, we, we ourselves are not experts in what is art. And I'm sure that if you asked 10 people on this call, what is art, you get 10 different responses. So we try to cast a wide net and try to be as inclusive as possible um, for folks. So we you know, work with the more traditional kind of conventional performing artists, musicians, uh, theater folks, fine artists, um, as well as folks who are in the sort of culinary arts, fashion, uh, digital arts, you know, animation, graphic design. Um, if you can ascribe or prescribe some sort of creative endeavor to it, we will seek to assist uh, folks in those lines of business and industries. In terms of the types of matters that, that we can assist with, um, by and large, the, the biggest area of, of assistance that we can provide and offer to artists and arts organizations is in the area of intellectual property protection and enforcement. So we assist artists in registering their works for copyright uh, or businesses in getting trademarks over their names and logos. Um, we also assist folks in licensing their intellectual property rights to others to allow the dissemination of their works um, and uh, to, to spell out the ownership of those works. Um, in the context of you know, arts and cultural nonprofits, we also assist in matters of incorporation and governance. Uh, so we can provide attorneys who can assist in maybe reviewing bylaws of an organization or in setting up a nonprofit organization for folks who are looking to sort of enter um, the nonprofit arts space. Um, we also deal a, a large amount with sort of contracts of every nature. I mean, performance agreements, I mentioned licensing agreements before, um, employment agreements, right? And just sort of reviewing, negotiating, drafting those agreements on behalf of, again, individuals and organizations to make sure that folks understand what they are either asking other people to sign on to or what they are being asked to sign. Um, and then there's a, a few other areas that we assist with as well, everything from you know, tax compliance to entertainment law generally, um, real estate, trust and estates and estate planning for individual artists. Um, but you know, for anybody who is experiencing any sort of legal matters or issues, we highly, highly encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, we have a website, pvla.org, that you can go to to submit uh, an application for pro bono services. And one of our staff members will be happy to work with you to identify the legal issues at stake and to try and identify a solution. Um, so now uh, after you know, that sort of, again, brief introduction, um, I would like to get us started and, and sort of kick off the panel discussion. And I'll start by uh, introducing each of our panelists in turn. Um, so first up, we have Sarah Geelan, who is the Deputy Director, General Counsel, and Assistant Secretary at the Barnes Foundation, um, an institution that many of you are obviously very aware of in the Philadelphia area. Ms. Geelan oversees all the legal matters for the Barnes in her role um, as General Counsel ensuring compliance with federal, state, and local laws and regulations, as well as uh, overseeing the institution's contractual obligations and ethical standards. 
She's also responsible for the risk management program with the Barnes and for overseeing the institution's insurance portfolio and has administrative oversight over the human resources area. Um, next up, we have Gregory Seltzer, who is a partner at the law firm of Ballard Spar here in Philadelphia. Uh, Greg is an experienced transactional attorney who utilizes and combines his knowledge of legal, accounting, and business principles to provide comprehensive, practical, and creative business law services. In addition to his sort of general practice of handling mergers and acquisitions for larger, uh, you know, private equity companies, uh, Greg also has a good amount of experience in the music and restaurant industries, representing music producers, venues, and music festivals, along with several nationally recognized restaurants, bars, and retail food and drink establishments. In addition to his work as an attorney, Greg is also a highly active member of the music community here in Philadelphia and a spirited proponent of that community. Uh, he has actually founded and produces every year the annual Philly Music Fest, which is a nonprofit uh, sort of event that donates all of its proceeds to local musicians and local music education charities. So Greg is very well versed in, in sort of the music scene here in Philly. Um, and then last but not least, we have Jeffrey Traster, uh, Senior Vice President with Hub International of Greater Philadelphia, which is a division of Hub International Northeast, which is the world's fourth largest insurance broker, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, Jeff has been engaged in risk and insurance management since 1990. So I'm terrible at math, but it, it, quite a long time. Um, and in 19, from 1996, uh, for about 23 years afterwards, Jeff uh, and a partner of his were working in a boutique commercial insurance practice prior to his joining uh, Hub International, uh, which was primarily responsible for local to global risk and insurance management projects for over 3,000 clients across a variety of businesses and professions, including performing arts, uh, it, both individual artists and arts and cultural venues. Um, so we have, again, want to thank each of our panelists for being on the call today. Uh, and before I get started with sort of the discussion and the questions that we have lined up from some of the folks who submitted questions during registration, uh, I do want to note that throughout the course of the discussion, we will be collecting uh, other additional questions, uh, live questions in the chat, um, which Tom will be monitoring and, and collecting and gathering. Um, so if you want to submit a question, if you, you have an additional thought that, that gets prompted maybe by something that one of our panelists is discussing or, or sharing with the group, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Tom will collect all of those questions and we'll try to address as many of them as we can towards the end in the live Q&A session. I do wanna just kind of note for everybody that these questions um, in general, you should try to keep it to sort of more generally applicable or, or practical matters or issues. Um, we, we don't wanna necessarily treat this as a, an opportunity for a one-on-one, -on -one, what would amount to a legal consultation. Uh, obviously, if you do have a question that's a little bit more individualized or a little bit more specific, you can always feel free to contact myself or reach out to PVLA and we'd be happy again to set you up with one of our volunteer attorneys to try and address that question for you. Um, but so without further ado, let me just get us started. And I'd like to start with sort of a, a contextualizing question, um, something to get us thinking about why we're here today, why we're here discussing sort of best practices for reopening. Um, and that is, you know, sort of what are some of the risks uh, that are associated for arts and cultural organizations and institutions around reopening to either the general public or to their staff members who may be returning to the office or to the organization's kind of headquarters. Um, so whoever wants to sort of get us started on that, um, feel free to jump in. Well, I can say that um, I don't know that there are a huge number of real litigation risks to the idea of people contracting COVID in your institution, whether it's employees or visitors. It's just there hasn't, people have worried about it a lot, but there, to my knowledge, there has not been a lot of litigation on that where someone is going and saying specifically they got sick and it's the fault of 
a venue or an organization or an employer. The way we've approached the concern is more about, um, you know, compliance with regulations that were in place and there were quite a lot. And so ensuring that we were complying with them, the liability that might be created from non-compliance, which you know is different than from contracting COVID. Um, and to the extent we were creating rules either to comply with regulations or to create assurance and comfort um, to patrons or staff, we took seriously the, and continue to take seriously, the uh, liability that could be created in just not meeting the standard you set for yourself and you articulate, whether it's creating, th still the question, what, what exactly would the harm be done uh, mm -hmm. would have to be proved, but you know, we always worry as much about the reputational harm and the relationship harm as the legal liability. So um, we consider those things together in ensuring when we set out the rule and the standard that we're going to comply with it. If we change it, that we're very clear on it, articulating what the change is and why. Gotcha. Excellent. Ryan, I would, I would jump in real quick and just drive off of something that Sarah said. I think it's really important almost for every question that's going to come up. Um, and you, I think you used the perfect word is contextualized. So I, I think for every question that we're going to talk about, we need when assessing risk, we need to think about the, the two groups of people largely that we're talking about. One is your um, obligation and the risk to a patron or a guest or a customer. Um, and then your obligation to your employees and staff, whether they're contractors or employees. And each organization will have, um, fortunately or unfortunately, it's just how the laws are written and how current practices, you have certain obligations, actually a heightened obligations for your employees and staff, as opposed to your patrons. Um, that's, we don't have to get into the weeds, but it's grounded in the logic of patrons choose to come to the barns, for example, patrons choose to come to a restaurant or a concert venue. And if, if they feel it's unsafe, you apprise them of the risks, you put safeguards, they don't have to come. Employees um, need to make a living and the EEOC and a lot of organizations um, are, are laser focused on heightened uh, safeguards for employees. Um, sure, they have a choice to go work somewhere else, but that's not a choice that we're willing to put on an employee. So, um, you know, this is rooted in decades of law with, you know, unionization and safe work conditions. But for each topic that we talk about, you know, whether it's um, mask mandates or waivers, and I know we're going to get into a lot of that stuff, but we should always be thinking, um, are we talking about safety and risk of patrons? and or safety and risk for employees. So, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there at the top. And then Ryan, maybe as we go through, if people have questions, we can try to isolate um, those two distinctions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely think that's an important distinction to make. And then Jeff, obviously um, the, the risk assessment guru over here, uh, anything to add here? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that there is uh, typically a tendency for any business to, use as its primary risk management technique uh, that which transfers risk to an insurance company. You pay a premium, you buy a policy, and if a bad thing happens, there's a financial backstop to respond. Um, you know, this situation in many ways is altogether different. Uh, there isn't an insurance policy that's specifically going to respond to a COVID-related issue. Um, but it doesn't mean that the risk can't be managed. And so I think that the, the goal is perhaps to refocus on the management of risk that does not involve transferring it to an insurance company. There are some risks that can be avoided, but uh, practically speaking to operate uh, any type of business, um, there are more risks that have to be retained. And so if they are, if those risks are being retained uh, as a necessity of operating the business, uh, there are other methods that have to be sought to manage those risks in a way that create a safe workplace for employees and a safe 
uh, environment for uh, customers um, uh, to visit. So uh, again, I think there's a real need to uh, reorient ourselves in, in terms of how we manage risk from the typical uh, purchase of an insurance policy. Sure. Got it. So it sounds like adding further context to sort of the risks that, that are present, um, there's also this added kind of perception that there isn't the typical safety net that organizations might be able to rely on in the form of an insurance policy that, that they may have in place, that that is not there for purposes of COVID-related incidents. Uh, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, excellent. Um, so now that we sort of have that broader context and we've talked about some of, some of the risks that organizations might face, uh, I wanna sort of start a conversation and, and start a dialogue around what are the methods that organizations can employ to try and manage those risks and to try to you know, keep their workplace or their, their events and their programs for patrons uh, as safe as possible to minimize that risk for the organization and its employees. Um, so I'll start with probably, I think one of the biggest topics of conversation among arts organizations and, and really the general public, which is the topic of, of COVID vaccination. Um, and I know that there have been a lot of sort of questions that, that have surfaced uh, around the subject of, you know, can organizations require either their patrons or their employees to be vaccinated in order to gain entry um, or to return to work? Uh, so why don't we, we'll start with that question and we'll, we'll try to address that. Uh, um, I think anyone, again, open it to the, the three of you to respond to that. I, I can jump in just real quick with kind of the state of the, the state of the world on that in terms of the law. Um, as you would imagine, laws take a long time to um, come into fruition. Um, this vaccination law, the federal government came out and said, look, that's going to be kind of a state by state um, decision. So um, I can speak to Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania actually is kind of the prevailing um, thought across the country right now. So the the bottom line is employers um, and the EEOC came out recently and supported the following, which is employers can require their employees to be vaccinated. Um, so that's number one. Um, event spaces can also require their customers to be vaccinated. Um, that, that is a well, much more well settled principle, but it was hotly contested in terms of can an employer require employees to be vaccinated. And right now the EEO, EEOC is backing the thought that yes, they can, but states can make their own determination. Um, the, the second real kind of rub there is if an employee does not get vaccinated, can they be terminated? And that is not a settled question yet. Um, where we're advising clients right now is that they should um, take that question very seriously and um, it's a very facts and circumstances question. So the employee that does not want to be vaccinated concurrent with company policy is a customer facing individual or has high interaction with other employees. Um, that person can be either asked to stay home and if their job cannot be performed at home, we have had employers terminate employees for not being vaccinated. Um, those cases, of course, there was wrongful termination cases against the employers, and those have not been settled yet. So we're still in a gray area in that, but um, I, I think our advice, again, case by case analysis, but this, what lawyers are telling uh, employers right now is you can have a vaccination mandate. You can ask for proof of vaccination to come back to the workplace. Um, if you have an unvaccinated person or that refuses to be vaccinated, please seek counsel and you're gonna get questions about that person's fundamental job um, and interactions with other folks. And if you have to terminate that person, um, I don't wanna say this too strongly, but I think the law is favoring that you can terminate that person. Um, and probably be free of a wrongful termination claim if they uh, bring an action. So that's kind of the state of um, employer mandates at the moment. So I figured I would just get that out there. Sure, gotcha. And then Sarah, Jeff, anything to add to that? Uh, the only thing I can add to that, just from my research of the subject, is that uh, everything that you've just heard uh, is consistent with um, 
with my own research. Um, but uh, one thing that keeps coming up in, uh, in what I read, uh, and it is starting to happen across the country, uh, where uh, there are mandatory vaccinations required by employers, uh, it does create a little bit of a minefield when employees uh, resist uh, the vaccination for religious reasons or medical reasons. Uh, and um, in a few cases, those are developing into wrongful termination suits. So, um, you know, again, I agree with everything you just heard. And I think um, you know, most of, of uh, the situations when done correctly uh, should not uh, result in, in action against the employer. But uh, I have noticed um, from my research, um, you know, this, this potential minefield that may be out there for employers. And, and just, to, just to, that's a great point, Jeff, just to drill down on that for a second, um, just kind of go slightly more into the weeds on that. Um, I mean, if someone's objecting, because of religious grounds or medical, um, now you're kind of getting more towards a protected class. Someone that does not want a vaccination is not someone that's necessarily in a protected class. And a protected class means that people in protected class cannot be discriminated against. They have certain elevated rights. So someone that's just anti-vaccinations, just principally, uh, is not in that class. But if it's due to a religious belief or um, an issue of race, potentially, or um, a medical issue, a disability. Um, now you're getting into kind of protected classes. And again, nothing settled on the law, but I would make a distinction that you should really consider whether you're a public organization or a private organization. So a private company um, that doesn't take public funding, which may be troubling here, but it, that's not a um, public organization by the state, um, that private institution is going to have a lot more leeway with their policies with respect to people that are even in protected classes, whereas public organizations, state um, bodies, they are going to have a much more rigorous analysis done of their policies. Um, there was a recent Supreme Court case in Philadelphia that went all the way up um, to the Supreme Court of the United States. It was just decided on, um, it was religious beliefs and LGBTQ uh, foster care, really interesting case that just went to the Supreme Court and was decided. The, the key there is that that was a state organization. So um, they were scrutinized much more heavily as the city of Philadelphia, much more heavily than a private organization. So when you're thinking about that issue that Jeff raised, of, is it for medical grounds or whatever, you should also consider the nature of your organization. Gotcha. I would um, just, recommend people think about what it is they're hoping to achieve with a mandate. Um, if you just think it'd be really great to be able to tell people, hey, we're 100% vaccinated, or, you know, you just think that's going to be an easy win. I think you just want to think through what you're going to do when you get the medical exception request, the religious exception request whether you are really prepared to fire people who won't be vaccinated, what if they're your best worker? Um, and, you know, and if you are, maybe you'll win your case, but you might be spending time defending a case for someone suing you for wrongful termination. So with everything in the scheme of everything else you're doing, of reopening, setting new policies, everything else. Is this how you want to be spending the time monitoring it? The EEOC has said that vaccination status is personal medical information. So it's got to be handled as such, kept with the HR department. I'm saying specific people need to get the information, keep the information, keep it private. Um, and once you've created this mandatory situation, you have a situation where you've opened it up to other employees, and managers, and folks to all be asking about everyone else's status. And, uh, you know, do, do you want that to be the dynamic going in? 
And, you know, what if it's not the easy when you think it is and you're really 90% vaccinated or 75%? Those are still good numbers, but for the people who are asking, is anything short of 100% really going to satisfy those folks? So, Sure. And, and I guess just to follow up on some of the things or the, the issues that have been raised, I know most of this uh, conversation about vaccination mandates we've been talking about in the context of like the employment scenario where, you know, you're asking your employees, I think, Craig, you had mentioned that for patrons, and, and I think that this goes back to your, your general distinction at the beginning of the, the call or the, the discussion that, you know, there's generally speaking less restrictions or less protection around patrons who, as you said, choose to come. Uh, but I just wanted to make it clear, is there like, for example, any of those exceptions, the, the religious or medical exceptions to the sort of mandate do those apply equally in the sort of patron space or, or not as much? It's going to, it, it's going to lean more towards the private organization's ability. Again, if it's a, if it's a, you know, if it's the capital building for the state or if it's the, you know, a, um, some governmental uh, public park or something like that, I think they will, those organizations and those parks and city buildings will have a difficult time um, not admitting patrons and customers if they're objecting on religious or medical grounds or, or any other um, grounds related to um, a protected class. A private institution, uh, you know, just in my world, a lot of the music venues that I represent across the country, also big music festivals, which are mostly outdoors, so it's a little bit different. Um, but the indoor venues are requiring vaccinations. If someone does not have a vaccination, their vaccination card or showing proof of it, they're not allowed entry. Um, I did just for purposes of this panel, reach out to a couple of folks that you know, are in ops at these venues. I said, hey, just out of curiosity, have you heard from people that say, oh, I wanna go, I see you're requiring vaccinations, I'm not getting a vaccination because I don't believe in them or, um, and, and if so, what are you doing? And, and honestly, it was, it was a little surprising, but they've had very few people reach out and indicate that um, they want to go to a show or a concert or an event, um, but don't have a vaccination, don't intend to get one. I did ask, you know, what are the thoughts on letting that person in? Um, they said that they're probably not going to at this point until there's more data. Um, again, private organizations, no government funding, um, you know, and, and I think that's legally sound, actually. I, I think they'll probably be okay on that front. Gotcha. And then one of the other things that I wanted to touch on with, with respect to vaccinations, obviously, I, I think this was previously mentioned by one of the panelists, but if you're going to mandate vaccination, you obviously need to have a way to verify that the person that you're talking about, whether they be an employee or a patron, a, a, some way to verify their vaccination status. So I just wanted to touch on briefly, like, is it you know, permissible for an organization to request that proof of vaccination and what forms of proof are able to be requested versus maybe some forms of proof that may not be able to be requested. Sarah, I don't know if you want to take that. I'm not sure if the Barnes is, is, has policies or is requiring vaccinations. And if so, what, you know, what you're asking folks to show, if not, I can comment on just what I've seen generally. Yeah, we, we are not. I mean, I, I know New York State, for instance, has their own Excelsior Pass. Um, it, I think helps if there's a central um, accepted uh, mode in the locality to establish it. Um, otherwise, just anecdotally, all I have heard is people asking to see vaccination cards. Yeah, and that's what I've seen too. I've, I've gone to some events um, and people are asking for vaccination cards. There's also some software that's popped up that's very easy um, that plugs into the ticket buying process where you need to upload when you buy the tickets for the event you have to upload your vaccination card and um, the software kind of reads the card matches it to the, the ticket buyer and you know gives a double thumbs up on the technology system and allows that person access one footnote that I would say that I heard from a couple venues is that um, this sounds ominous but I, I think it does make sense I want to mention it that um, they're increasing their security budget um, and particularly their security budget at the door um, for very probably unhappy folks that maybe don't have the right documentation or that are going to be turned away. 
lot of music venues and a lot of arts venues, um, you know, they just have, you know, regular security and it's usually protecting the stage um, more so than the door. Um, a lot of venues in the fall are thinking that some people, unhappy people are gonna have to be turned away um, if vaccinations are required for improper documentation or no documentation. And um, it was just mentioned to me that security budgets are going up a bit to accommodate, you know, getting people off the premises if they need be. So I mentioned that for what it's worth. And, and one thing I'd like to add to, to what both Greg and, and Sarah have discussed um, on both the employee side and the, the customer or patron side, um, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting twist. We, we are talking about ways that we can best manage the risk of having people back into our cultural organizations and music venues. Um, but I, I think we, we need to be very careful um, in many respects, uh, the types of practices and procedures that will be in place, um, you know, as, as Sarah said, uh, you know, how do we validate uh, if an employee is vaccinated? Do we, do we collect that information? It's now protected health information. Or as Greg said, you know, do we have increased security? And, and what happens if there's, uh, and, and this is my comment, what happens if, if a confrontation results? Um, you know, it's, it's almost like we're trading one risk for other risks. Uh, now, though, fortunately, those other risks uh, are either addressed by insurance policies organizations already have, or those policies are available to address those types of risks. But um, but most importantly about my comment is, again, to be careful about this simple trading of risk, uh, satisfying or, or addressing one at the expense of uh, allowing in another. That's an excellent point. Thank you so much, Jeff, for, for bringing that up. Um, and I think that's an important point for a lot of organizations to consider when they're thinking about, again, sort of where do they shift the risk and what risks are they gonna be trading for others? Um, so, you know, moving on from the vaccination, which again, I, I know has been sort of a really big uh, talking point among a lot of organizations that I've heard from and, and that other folks have heard from. Um, I want to talk about just some of the other sort of safety practices or protocol um, that we've seen throughout the pandemic, right, um, in the form of COVID testing, masks, uh, social distancing, just wanted to touch on each of these maybe a little bit more briefly, but certainly touch on them um, in the context of, again, both patrons and employees. Are there sort of best practices in place? Uh, how have those changed over the course of the pandemic? Where are we now? Um, so again, I'd like to open that up to, to the three of you to start, and then we can get into maybe some more specific questions as we go along. I'm happy to jump in. Um, it, one thing that I, and this is just maybe more of an observation, um, again, not a lot of law on this point, um, but it's, it's a little, it's interesting that with vaccinations, employers and venues are seemingly kind of getting their C-suite together, talking with folks like Jeff on risk, how can we mitigate, and really making a mindful, thoughtful decision about vaccinations. What should we do with vaccinations, right? And then with masks, um, when I ask the questions of my, my clients and that, they just, they say, whatever, whatever the, the city mandate is, we're gonna do. So there, it's just like more of a default kind of to the, to the pronouncement of local government, municipal government, maybe even federal government at some point. But um, so that's what I'm seeing kind of on masks and social distancing, even like L&I and inspections, you know, with table distancing apart in restaurants. So kind of a different thought process. And I don't know if we have time to explore that concept, but that's just what I'm seeing uh, with respect to masks and social distancing and how that differs from vaccinations. Sure. And Sarah, uh, I think you had a comment as well. Do you want to maybe talk about what you've seen in this space? Well, it's just until recently, there, the regulations were so precise. We were following a uh, number of people per square feet, uh, you know, having plexiglass, distance requirements, um, 
And we had to adjust those, you know, we, for instance, went from a mandate of five people per thousand square feet to 10 people per thousand square feet to 20 people per thousand square feet. So we were changing, you know, capacity and room restrictions, things like that. Um, when though, since those were sort of gradually lifted, uh, it was natural for us once they were pulled back all together. By then we were actually already back at our norm. So, and, and if you know the barns, you know that we, uh, we keep people pretty, pretty socially distanced anyway for the safety of the art. So, um, you know, in, in that way, it, it remains um, uh, sort of controlled. And it's one of the reasons we felt that museums we're a safe place to open early. It's it's not a place, it's not a concert venue where people are on top of each other. Um, what, what I think is the challenge for a venue opening now without those uh, restrictions is that you have to figure out what's the right thing to make people comfortable. So I've seen, for instance, some movie theaters saying, we are at half capacity, everyone can have a seat between them and the next person. Um, so again, as you know, I sort of said in my first comment, I just think the important thing is if you're saying that, if you're saying these things that aren't the mandate to reassure people, you better make sure you have good mechanisms in place to keep them up um, and figure that out when they were strict mandates there was a lot of time and effort put into signage marking things off if there were seats that you couldn't sit in they were removed or made it impossible for people to sit in them it's more difficult if you're being looser if you're just saying well we only sold 50 percent of the tickets um but i'm not going to be there if a stranger comes and sits on your lap so, you know, I, I think those are the things people have to think about and that gets into, you can have rules, you can post rules, you can tell people their expectations, but are you training your staff to deal with the situations and the interactions they may have? Or do they feel empowered to tell someone they have to move even if that person doesn't want to move? Do your employees feel supported that they're not going to be fired for ejecting a visitor who won't comply? So I think that's all the the process where you have to set the rule and back it up. Yeah, and Ryan, I, I have a question and follow up for Sarah, but before that, I just want to reiterate and just completely agree that I mean, worse than not having a policy is having a policy and not following it. Um, that's just tried and true, litigated in employment and kind of invited guest case law. Um, so if you have a policy, you, you better be following it. Um, question for Sarah, actually. I'm curious, everyone, most people have been to the barns. You're very mindful about light on, on the artwork. I'm curious, um, have you given thought anything with air? Um, is there air? I see air purification systems and maybe would, would that affect the art and stuff like that? I'm just curious if you've gone to the purification um, question yet. We absolutely did. We did that early in the pandemic. Uh, luckily for us, we are a very new building and we have systems that could do it. Uh, it sort of blows your, your lead and your uh, environmental yeah. concerns a little when you're bringing in all that fresh air, but we do have the capacity to still temperature regulate the fresh air coming in. It just uses a lot more energy, but we did that. There were mandates. Um, these are things also to look at. OSHA and others put mandates out. Um, I'm not sure if they've been pulled back yet. I would have to look at that. But uh, we, we, since we have been open since the last July, except for a brief closure over the holidays, we, um, we took that very seriously in the beginning. That's interesting. I mean, I've been seeing them at restaurants and now I'm seeing them at venues. I mean, Jeff, I wonder if premiums will come down um, at some point or if there's any effect of, you know, air purification systems on insurance underwriting. Um, 
I don't think it's going to have any impact, at least in the near term, simply because um, the issue of um, claims resulting from communicable disease, pandemic, COVID-19, um, you know, these are now strictly uh, black and white spelled out in, in insurance contracts as, as not being covered uh, for most forms of coverage. Now, certainly workers' compensation still will respond to um, COVID-19 as a workplace illness. Um, and, and so is it possible from that perspective that it, it aids any particular business in, in being uh, able to present themselves to underwriters in the best possible light? I would say the answer is yes. But in a general sense, um, you know, I think it really speaks a lot to um, the example that Sarah gave about the movie theater operating at half capacity. And, and I think that, that there is this tug of war between what should be done from a public safety standpoint and what can be done from a practicality standpoint for that business to operate and operate profitably and for, in many cases, to catch up for lost revenue uh, during the pandemic. And so, um, you, you know, while I think that is a great idea, and, and if I were uh, working with a client that had made the investment to have that type of system installed, I would make the most of that uh, that I could with prospective underwriters, uh, because I think it does speak to the quality of the risk. Uh, but in general, no, if everyone were to go out and do it, I don't think pricing would come down. And then to reiterate, I think ju there's just this practical issue of even though you'd want to do it, can you in light of all the catching up you need to do revenue wise anyway? And, you know, you may not be a, a business that can operate at half capacity. Uh, and, you know, you're really just being squeezed and this becomes yet another thing that you can or should do, but can't. And so, um, you know, I think it remains to be seen how well adopted that is um, for businesses that uh, are not doing quite as well as, as uh, uh, the best performing restaurants, the best performing venues, et cetera, uh, revenue wise. So um, jury's out on that one, I think. That's all excellent points to talk about and touch on. I think that the main, what I'm, what I'm hearing here is sort of, you know, with the now lack of significant restriction or re regulation in place around the subject of like COVID safety measures, it's sort of a double-edged sword, right? Organizations are a lot more free to determine what's right for them, but there's this kind of, there's this ambiguity almost of what is the right answer based on a number of different factors that have been highlighted by Sarah, Jeff, and Greg, you know, what, what can we practically achieve in terms of our, our staffing, our, our capacity, and in terms of our, our you know, financial situation, right? What, what measures can we implement versus, again, what, what makes the public comfortable to, and what makes our employees comfortable to come back and return to the workplace or to our, our venue or our place of operation. So that's really important, I think, for a uh, takeaway for everybody to think about and to, to bring with them from this event. Um, I want to get into maybe just a few more specific questions on, on this that were raised during the registration, just to see if we can get some, some further guidance here uh, on the subject of the sort of social distancing. Um, I, I think Sarah had touched on this before, that there's this kind of understanding that for an organization like maybe the Barnes or another organization that already sort of tries to implement some semblance of social distancing norms uh, for their patrons, how, how can other organizations like maybe concert venues, for example, where there isn't assigned seating or fixed placement of the patrons or participants, how, how can organizations like that approach the issue of social distancing? Or is this just one of those questions that if they can't do it, they shouldn't say they're going to, right? Um, so again, happy to maybe, uh, Greg, if you wanna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's a similar mantra of, you know, don't have a policy if you can't really follow through on it. And, and I think Jeff, if, if Jeff, I can't remember the word you were just using. Um, I think you were saying practical. Um, and I think that was a very kind way, um, but I think profitable 
is, is also kind of an interchangeable word. Um, I, I think that a lot of businesses are recovering. Some got PPP funds, some got other disaster funding. And, you know, social distancing needs to be weighed with the health and the, you know, ability of the business to, to perform and be open. So um, I, I actually just think that social distancing is kind of going to um, be relaxed quite a bit in event spaces. Um, and I also jotted down a note with respect to social distancing that you also have to, I think, consider what type of business you are and what type of patrons you attract um, and be mindful of that. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the median age for the barns is, but, but let's just say that it's slightly older than like Firefly Festival in, um, you know, or like Coachella or something, right? So right. Um, the risk of injury or health risk for, you know, a music festival that is predominantly, you know, 16 to 22 year olds or something like that, the, you might be able to um, get your head around and be mindful and thoughtful about your risk differently than if you're, you know, something like a theater or like, a, you know, some kind of Broadway type um, play or something like that, where the audience might be older. So um, I think those those factors need to be considered as well. Yeah, I, I would. I would add. I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that, you know, and we may get into waivers or assumption of risk, but um, sort of the inverse of the policy is just to maybe make clear to people coming in, there aren't going to be social distancing measures, you know, just so that people know what they're getting into and you don't have that bait and switch, you know, or to say people are welcome to wear masks if they want to, they're not going to be required. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I think that, uh, that the only additional comment I'll make, uh, just as a consumer out in the world like everybody else, uh, you know, there was a very, very long period of time we couldn't do anything. Uh, and then uh, I guess an equally long period of time where we could do things, but on a restricted basis, social distancing, masks, capacity limits. And now public health officials have removed all of those restrictions and as a consumer, uh, and I, I know this, you know, personally, there is a considerable amount of pent up demand to enjoy the things we used to enjoy the way we used to enjoy them. Um, I attended a Sixers game at the Wells Fargo Center that was full capacity. Uh, there was no expectation, I would imagine, on anyone's part uh, with respect to social distancing. I think mask wearing was encouraged, but certainly wasn't enforced. And um, and and I think that the the concept of social distancing, um, while a good one, and certainly uh, public health officials believe that it it helps to slow uh, transmission. Uh, you know, that's something that is uh, fading away as people begin to use venues and services and. Um, and other businesses the way they had used them, the, the way they want to use them going forward. Um, unfortunately, we're not a changed society with respect to how we view um, the pandemic and its potential to occur again in some form uh, and, and what we had to go through to get past it. Um, we seem to be like a, uh, a rubber band and we've just flexed back to where we used to be and I think a lot of businesses realize it and, and are actually trying to use that to develop greater profitability. Uh, and I agree with Greg, uh, practicality and profitability are absolutely interchangeable in these conversations. Excellent. Um, so some more, I guess, specific questions around safety protocol, and then we'll, we'll get into some additional questions of how do those protocols shift in different situations for different organizations. Um, but generally speaking, with regard to like COVID testing and masks, um, there was actually a specific question that came up during registration of uh, an organization who had wanted to explore the concept of, you know, let's say if they do have a mask policy and somebody shows up at the door and they, I mean, it happens to me all the time, right? I forget my mask in my car or I forget it at home and, you know, I'm, I'm there, I have my ticket ready, but I just can't get in the door. Like, is there any risk associated or, or is there any kind of conception around like organizations providing masks to people like having just 
a box of disposable masks available at the door for people to pick up? Like, is that acceptable practice, not acceptable practice? Um, any, would, would welcome any comments or thoughts on that? I think it was an acceptable practice when uh, masks were mandated. Uh, and I uh, visited uh, quite a number of restaurants that would maintain a supply of masks for those people who, especially when Philadelphia had a different mandate than the suburbs did. Uh, the suburbs had relaxed, but Philadelphia was maintaining the mask mandate. Uh, restaurants were maintaining the supply because uh, naturally people coming from outside the city uh, where they're not using masks as frequently were forgetting. Um, but since Philadelphia relaxed, I haven't seen that at all in the past uh, several weeks. So I, I don't know how applicable it even is anymore, despite it being a good idea. Gotcha. I think if you're trying to have people wear masks now, you ought to have them available because fewer people are going to have them handy. Uh, something we thought a lot about um, is whether we want to put our frontline staff in the position of articulating and enforcing a rule that is stricter than the legal requirement. Um, it's a tough position to be in and to, to have a policy argument with someone who doesn't want to wear a mask anymore is challenging. So industries that do require them by law, like airlines, have a hard enough problem. And I, you know, it's just whether you want to invite that problem. Gotcha. And then um, in the context of, of COVID testing, right, are there sort of established best practices at this point around like what kind of tests organizations should require if they're going to require one? I know, um, Greg, you and I have talked in the past about sort of, you know, temperature checks at the door or asking people to provide proof of a negative test, like a clinical or self-administered test uh, within a certain number of days of an event. Um, is, is that still, you know, what, I guess, what are your thoughts or what are you hearing from venues on, on that subject? So it, it's interesting. Um, on, I guess broadly, I just want to make the distinction again between patrons and employees and staff. So I, I think, you know, testing for patrons and, um, you know, temperature checks for patrons, masks for patrons. I think we've, we've covered that and I'll mention temperature checks in a second, but with respect to staff, I think, um, periodic COVID testing, if that is something that your employer, you as an employer um, or your employer determines is useful uh, in their research and um, advice from their advisors, that is fine. Um, employees really will not have much of an objection if a policy and procedure of the company, of the employer, is for periodic testing. And just like vaccination requirements, if you don't comply with the policy, um, then you're subject to possibly being terminated, especially if you're in a private organization and not working for a government organization. Um, footnote there is if you're gonna have the policy, you better follow the policy um, and you better not be testing some people and not other people, you better be testing everyone. Um, so, you know, which is hard to do and it's hard to execute. So. Um, in terms of temperature checks, I mean, what I'm hearing from music venues and spaces um, like restaurants um, where there's a, a, a dense amount of people, um, temperature checks, I've been told, are just very inexpensive and quick. And the venues are continuing to use them, um, not restaurants as much anymore, but I think large music venues and, and event establishments will just because it kind of just keeps everyone comfortable. And if it, it, it's just kind of a light touch, low expense, quick measure at the door, um, that if there is an issue, if you're in Jeff's lap of um, a claim or something like that, um, it's just one other thing you can point to that says you are being diligent as, an, as a space owner. Um, and you know, if, if someone says, yeah, well, that design really even proven to be effective, that's not really the issue with the people I'm talking to. It's more of like, um, let's just do it. It doesn't hurt and it's quick. So I think you're gonna still see temperature checks um, at doors for music venues and event spaces. 
Gotcha. Any any other thoughts from Jeff or Sarah on that? Uh, otherwise, we can I think move on. Okay. So um, we've talked about obviously some of these safety protocol and, and measures that organizations can employ and how they can employ them with the sort of bigger takeaways of there's differences in the employment versus the patron space around you know how tight these restrictions are going to be and then also um, things for organizations to keep in mind around if they establish a policy can they enforce it can they maintain it um, how what are some of the factors uh, like for example how, how does a being, I think we all know that sort of like indoor versus outdoor spaces, right? If we have an outdoor music festival versus uh, an indoor exhibition space like the barns, you know, um, the perception that I have is, is that that sort of impacts the, how strict the restrictions need to be just from a kind of public perspective standpoint. Um, but then how do these guidelines and maybe specifically guidelines around vaccination, um, or testing, like how does that differ for organizations who work with youth or elderly populations, uh, right? We have a lot of organizations, I'm sure, who have sort of music or arts camp kind of activities for young adults who maybe are below the eligible vaccination age. Um, so how, do, how might that impact an organization's decision-making um, in, in regards to what measures they wanna employ? Maybe I'll just jump on that quick and I saw I just want to answer I think I saw a question in the chat it disappeared before I could see it all about maybe it was about temperature checks and what happens if someone you know has an elevated temperature at, at the door what do you do um, let me just um, let me just tell you what I've heard from venue staff on that and then Ryan I'll switch over and, and kick it to Jeff and Sarah on the outdoor indoor and elderly youth populations but for a restaurant it's going to be difficult from what I've heard in terms of temperature check, you're probably, if the restaurant has temperature checks and you have an elevated temperature, I think you're gonna have a problem coming into the establishment if that's their policy. Um, as I said, I think restaurants are moving away from temperature checks, but if they have one, I think they'll enforce it. With a venue, what I've heard is that venues, in addition to increased security, are going to probably have some medical professional at each event. Um, it'll just be someone on staff, it could be a nurse, um, and they're going to pay that person whatever they need to pay them and bake it into the ticket price and the model. And my understanding is if someone has an elevated temperature, maybe it was just 100 degrees outside and, and they're just running hot, um, that person will not necessarily be turned away at the door. They would be consulted by um, a nurse, maybe go into a separate designated area, be consulted by a nurse, maybe another temperature check in 15, 20 minutes once they cool down maybe ask them a series of other questions about their symptoms. And then that professional in the venue will make a determination whether they can enter or not. I think if you are gonna have temperature checks and at a big venue like a music festival, you're gonna to have to put some thought into the question of what happens if someone um, you know, has, a, has a temperature. Now, I, I've also been told that there's a difference in feeling between festivals and venues. Um, if someone lives in Philadelphia and they go over to Johnny Brenda's or World Cafe Live or in Ardmore, Ardmore Music Hall, and they just have a fever and then the nurse or the practitioner can't resolve it, that person might be turned away and, and they may be heading home. If someone's traveling from Georgia up to Firefly Music Festival in Delaware and the Newport Folk Festival, it's a little more difficult to try to turn that person away. So I've heard that festivals are going to take a lot more time and be more thoughtful in remediating, you know, someone's coughing, seeing coughing or something like that. They need that, you need to have a consequence for that. Um, and I think festivals and large outdoor gatherings are probably gonna be a lot uh, more tolerant of those, of those folks, maybe require masks or something like that. Um, but Sarah and Jeff, I'll let you tee up the indoor outdoor um, age population. Um, I'd say on, on the, uh, the temperatures, again, you should probably have a policy. So we had a policy that said specifically, if somebody uh, has a temperature, they will have the opportunity to cool down and take their temperature again at a certain, after a certain time. If they didn't want to wait around, they didn't have to, but that we held the line and it was clear on that. Um, 
you know, on the practicalities, having a generous refund policy always makes sense. I mean, if you're turning someone away but not giving their money back, you've got a bigger problem. Um, my understanding is museums that cater uh, largely to children are um, continuing to require masks. And that is more about the consumer preference that they think families are more likely to come if they are required uh, rather than recommended. And so uh, I don't specifically know about uh, places geared towards elderly populations. Um, although, you know, anecdotally, the elderly populations are uh, some of the most highly vaccinated and not always um, so interested in there being higher uh, requirements than necessary. Gotcha. On the indoor outdoor, the um, restriction, there used to be different sets of restrictions. All that's lifted now. So, um, you know, again, it's the comfort level. Some people, I think, are preferring outdoor venues still and prefer to know their outdoor options. But you know, the, the, the only thing that I would add, um, and, and it's to reiterate a, a comment I made earlier. Um, and, and so I think, I think Sarah, both Sarah and Greg have said, you know, if you're going to have some, some practice or procedure in this regard, make sure it's followed. And then the comment I would add, and it's, it's again, a reiteration of, of a previous comment, um, that, um, um, you know, you, you want to be very careful about trading one risk for another. And, um, and I think, uh, if um, a, a particular practice or procedure is not followed consistently, uh, too many exceptions are being made, uh, that creates um, a risk um, that, um, you know, that, that may bring about uh, legal action against you or may cause your insurance policies to have to be activated to uh, defend you. So, um, you know, I, I think that there is, uh, you know, what, what, what probably is, is most important is, is to use good common sense, uh, but most importantly, to be consistent uh, and, and, and recognize that, um, you know, and the adage, every action has a, a reaction. I mean, the, the reaction can be more severe uh, than the thing you're trying to address initially. So uh, just be cognizant of, of, of that issue. Sure, gotcha. And then uh, with respect to, moving on to another question, um, with respect to you know, all of these policies, these sort of safety measures that we've discussed, I think we've touched on briefly in, in giving other answers from the panelists, but just in general, is, are there best practices around how to communicate those policies to maybe members of the general public if you're on the patron side of things or to your staff members if you're on the employee side of things? It, are we talking, you know, do, do you have to get like signed acknowledgement of these policies from every person that walks through the door? Is it okay to just post a sign or put something up on your website or send out like an email to everybody kind of trying to put them on notice? Um, and then to the extent that, you know, I, I think Sarah has mentioned a number of times, like training staff to communicate policies to people who, to patrons who visit um, a venue or, an exhibition space, you know, what are what are some of the best practices around communicating these policies and putting people on notice? I think the rule has really been um, you can't you can't over communicate. Um, so if I were going to have a rule that was out of sync with the standard of the city, people would hear about it before they bought their ticket, it would be reiterated when they got their ticket and they showed up, they'd see some signage about it. And, um, you know, it, there would be a place on the website probably where they could find out more, um, you know, and, and again, I know I've mentioned staff a lot of times, but with the person who says, no, we still need masks, you have to put it on, it helps them a lot if there is something 
uh, visible, making clear that is the policy to avoid that. I want to speak to a manager moment. Um, you know, just thinking through the backup you have and all the opportunities, the chance for that person to know all the communications they got so they can say, actually, if you look at your ticket, if you look at your confirmation email, it says it there. All these things give support and avoid the, the bad um, interactions that, that then affect other visitors too. Sure. Yeah. Ryan, I think, you know, as a, as a consumer, um, you know, I think I've become numb to all of the messaging that I'm seeing about uh, policies and procedures and restrictions. Um, and uh, I think that that when it's most effective is when, uh, and really, as Sarah said, that message is repeated again and again and again so that it is ultimately absorbed. Um, and I think that's that's a technique that good marketers use. And uh, it's a very good technique here because the message is still important. Gotcha. And I, Ryan, I would just add point of sale. I mean, you know, every business is different, but try to try to have the messaging some somehow adjacent or commensurate with your point of sale. If that's at the door, great. If it's online in the ticket buying platform, have something there. Do I think you need it to be like, you know, a click wrap, um, you know, click through on the ticket buying where you accept to follow the terms and conditions or the policies or anything? I don't think that's necessary. It's a nice thing to have if you think that your consumers will not be bothered by that. Like Jeff said, a lot of people now are unfazed they just click whatever they need to click to get the ticket to go to the thing. But um, if that's problematic for you from a software perspective or, or it's just something you don't want. I don't think you need a written acknowledgement or an electronic acknowledgement, but I would try to have the policy somewhere adjacent to the point of sale. Um, some people like, and I think Sarah makes a good point. You should also probably have an area on your website for someone to click a tab to go and see what the what what the policies are of that organization. But I don't I don't know that I feel comfortable. Maybe it's just personal experience and not legal advice of just having the tab with the policy and not either linking to it or having it somewhere, excuse me, somewhere um, adjacent to the point of sale. Gotcha. That's excellent, I think, uh, sound advice all around. Um, and then one, one other kind of unique question that came up in, uh, from someone during the registration is obviously we've talked about in the context of like a vaccine mandate, for example, what happens if you have an employee who indicates, you know, they, they refuse to get a vaccine. What do you do in that situation? And we talked about some of the exceptions that might need to be made to that rule. Um, but what do you, what do you have if you have an employee who feels uncomfortable returning to work, right? Who is not comfortable going back to the workplace? How do you handle that situation? And how can you handle that situation as an employer? Sarah, I don't, I don't know if you've, tackled that as, as an employer. I'm just curious, I can give you my perspective. I'm just curious if you've had that situation. Sure, we definitely have. Um, you know, obviously it depends on the job. So some jobs can be handled differently um, and the policy of the institution. Uh, you know, some are deciding to remain remote. Um, mm -hmm and or being very flexible and everyone can do what they prefer. Um, and others are saying, no, we're coming back to the office. And uh, the Barnes has always had jobs that had to be on site. Mm -hmm. um, and we have had people who have said throughout, you know, they don't feel comfortable, they don't wanna take mass transit. Um, and we, you know, that has meant some people have resigned their jobs because of it. So, um, you know, somebody not willing to comply with a requirement of the job is cause for termination. Um, that's not going to be a controversial um, issue. So you certainly can. Um, if you're 
are getting a request for an accommodation for a disability or medical reason. Um, it's the same rules as there have ever been. You know, you might have had an employee with a bad back who said years ago that they can't do their commute and they need to work from home. And uh, you may have needed to go through a process to see whether you could make that as a reasonable accommodation. So um, those rules still apply and you can follow those. If you decide to go the middle route of saying, well, you know, we'll, we'll consider your request and maybe we'll let you be remote, then I would just caution that you um, have some good processes in place to make sure that you're being fair and equitable in those decisions and that the nobody has a claim for discrimination when you say, well, you know, these three folks who I've always liked can work from home, but these two that I've never liked, they can't. Um, maybe you can justify that with documented performance issues and then that would be okay. But, you know, if, if there were some protected class issues um, distinguishing the two groups of people, I'd be very careful about that. And I would think about that. And I might well um, consult with an employment lawyer if you're mm -hmm. about to roll out a set of rules for what coming back to the workplace is and uh, make sure a neutral eye thinks that you have some good neutral object uh, criteria. Sure, and then Greg, you, you said you had uh, maybe a few other comments as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it just depends on the employer and it depends on the, the risk of the person at issue. Um, you know, for example, at the law firm, we very easily um, kind of pivoted to remote workforce. We're a services organization um, with, you know, decent technology that we got in the hands of our folks and it was kind of simple. Um, most of my clients did not have that experience, especially in retail and events and, and music and performance. Um, and they, as Jeff said, they've had a, a lot of them that have had a tough 18 months or so. And I think that we cannot look down upon them for not being able to be as accommodating as you know, an institution that has a, a, a big budget or endowment or a, a large law firm that has the ability to, to make implement those, ish, those, those things. So um, we have to be mindful and conscious and we can't always put um, overtax those organizations to be accommodating if they have someone that is not wanting to be vaccinated or what, 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 what happens. That said, it's incredibly important to evaluate the risk of terminating that individual. And this is not really um, isolated to COVID and these issues. This is, this is your protected class folks. So if you have someone that's not comfortable um, and you're considering terminating that person, if that person is over 40 years old, if that person is, is you know, racially or ethnically diverse, if that person is in um, you know, a, a gender or some sort of a non-binary, category, you have to consult um, an employment expert, um, irrespective of what the issue is. Because I think what you'll find is that if in the restaurant world, for example, a lot of young people, um, you know, employers have gotten their head around someone that doesn't want to work, I'm just going to have to let you go. I haven't had revenue for 12 months. I, I, I don't know what else to do. Um, but if the, the person is in a protected class, that calculus is going to be different. So. Um, it's probably the best I can give you on that of, of, sure. of how to kind of think through it. Yeah. And I mean, I think it sounds like an opportunity for folks who, again, maybe on the call, if, if you do have these questions, if you do have staff members and you want to know sort of what your organization can or should do, like come see us at PVLA. We can try to set you up with one of our volunteers who work in the employment space and, and maybe get a consultation um, on that, that basis. Um, and then Jeff, was there anything that, that you wanted to add here? Yeah, I, I, I would simply add that um, fortunately, this, um, this part of the discussion surrounds issues that are insurable. Uh, your organizations out there may already have this form of insurance, um, whether it be for the uh, negligent acts of those managing the organization and making the decision surrounding the issues we're talking about today, um, 
or whether it be um, for wrongful employment acts with respect to uh, discrimination, harassment, or wrongful termination. Uh, the point I would like to make here, though, is that uh, like any insurance policy, uh, what your organization has purchased is a legal contract between your organization and the insurance company. And like all legal contracts, they differ from one to another, from one insurance carrier to another, from one policy type to another. Um, and we're really, as a society in uncharted territory, uh, we're talking about issues we uh, as business owners, as consumers, uh, as citizens, we've not had to really deal with in our lifetimes. And, and so um, I would strongly suggest that um, organizations uh, revisit uh, their executive risk uh, forms of insurance protection uh, with their insurance professionals, with their board members and, and other stakeholders Make sure there's an understanding of what the organization has, what it doesn't, what's commercially available in the marketplace that they could have to fill gaps. Um, this is an area where insurance can be relied upon for both legal defense and a financial backstop for any judgment or settlement that may result against the organization. But whether it performs in um, a way that um, you would find uh, predictable or acceptable um, really is determined well before a claim has ever occurred. And the time is right now to revisit these issues uh, and make sure that what is in place uh, is appropriate for the uh, protection elements uh, your particular organization needs. That's Jeff, would the, would the Google search term be EPL coverage or what, what would people look at? Is that kind of the buzz term? Or yeah, I would, I would say uh, a, few, a few buzz terms. Executive risk is one. Um, directors and officers liability and other employment practices liability um, would be a third. Um, uh, many of these coverages and the reason executive risk is a term that I use uh, many of these uh, specific forms of insurance, employment practices, liability, directors and officers liability, fiduciary liability, these are all packaged together into, um, very often packaged together into a single policy known as an executive risk policy or a management liability policy. So management liability would be another buzz term that uh, you could Google as well. Excellent. That's all very, again, excellent points. Jeff, thank you so much for, for getting into that. And I think in your response, you sort of highlight a perfect transition to the next group of questions that I wanted to ask, which is all about, you know, we've talked about some of the safety protocol and the, and the policies that organizations can implement uh, to try and, and mitigate risks of contracting COVID or, or, you know, risks associated with COVID for their guests and employees. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the legal documents or contracts uh, that people can enter into and, and how those may have been impacted. Um, and the number one question that I saw from, we're gonna start with this one, we sort of saved one of the best for last, but um, one of the most popular questions I saw from organizations who were filling out the registration was, can I ask either employees or patrons to sign a waiver, right? Can I have this in place uh, for people who either want to visit and, and um, frequent our establishment or who work in that establishment around issues related to COVID. Is that a good idea? Why or why not? Um, so I, I'll open this up to, to all three of you. Maybe, Greg, if you want to get us started and then um, we'll hear other comments. Sure. Overall. Sure. This is another one that's kind of a TBD, but I'll give you the state of the world at, as we sit today. Um, and it's a little different than some of the other items that we've tackled. Um, and it dates back to case law from the 1920s, which I'll spare you. Um, but the, um, the general rule I would say here is that waivers, written waivers by a patron or a customer uh, or, or someone, someone that's coming into your establishment um, where they're waiving their recovery rights for COVID. That seems to be uh, enforceable. The first couple of cases are suggesting that those waivers, people um, you know, can waive their, their rights to COVID. Now, the, the footnote to that is 
they're waiving them because a lot of times they're relying on the policies that you have. So if your establishment violates those policies, it probably invalidates the waiver. So assuming you're consistently applying and have your policies and enforcing them, um, then I think that your patrons um, can sign a waiver and ultimately if they get sick and sue, um, the prevailing thought right now is that waiver will be sound and enforceable. The contrary to that, the prevailing theory right now is that employees um, should not be uh, asked to sign a waiver and that employees will likely, um, that waiver will not be enforceable for your employee versus the employer. And it, again, it's founded in case law that employers have a heightened duty and obligation for the health and safety and welfare of their employees than they do for the people that are electing to come into the establishment. So right now, um, you know, at Ballard Spa nationally, this is not the law, this is our best practice. We are advising employers to not solicit or obtain waivers from employees. Um, that may change at some point, but right now that's that's where we're at. So I guess I'll just pause there before we um, unpack anything, see if there's anything in the chat or Jeff and Sarah have anything. Sure, Jeff, Sarah, do you guys have anything to add on the, on the subject of waivers? I do not. I, I just point out, you know, you, you can't ask someone to waive your obligations to adhere to OSHA guidelines. So, um, and you shouldn't ask to, and that, that's going to be a bad factor <laughs> in any OSHA claim. Sure. Absolutely. I guess I would, I would also say that um, what I'm hearing from clients is that, that are asking about this, and we're providing this advice. Most are not requiring um, waivers of patrons and customers, um, just anecdotally. Uh, I, I don't know that it feels right. I think a lot of people are trying to get back to business and getting people in their establishment and any other barrier that they have to getting people, you know, anything to click, anything to wave. Um, it's just that a lot of businesses are not doing it um, that are needing people and bodies in their establishments to generate revenue. It's really the employees and the employers that um, you're, th that's where a lot of the questions uh, were, that we were getting or from, can I have my employee base wave? Um, and, and again, that answer is going to be no. Sure. Gotcha. Um, and then the other sort of contract related issue that I wanted to get into, and this is probably mostly for maybe like performing arts venues is how has COVID-19 affected best practices around sort of maybe your standard terms and provisions in a performance agreement or an agreement with an artist that the organization is hosting at their venue, at their, their place of business. Um, what, what sort of changes that have we seen in that space in that regard? Um, and again, I'll, I'll open this up to the three of you, um, but if any of you wants to get us started. I'm start. happy to get us started and then I'll kick over to Jeff because he mentioned something about you know, was dancing around this carve out in insurance policies. Um, so I think this segues in, but, you know, there's this term force majeure in a lot of contracts. Um, and this, again, just to contextualize, this is, this is not necessarily a performing arts space or an event vis-a-vis -vis their employees or vis-a-vis -vis their customers. Let's, let's use the illustration example that this is, um, you know, the event space with a band or the event space with um, a conference that's coming into your event space. So it's kind of like a B2B, if you will, um, scenario. So the force majeure provision in a contract will say that if one party breaches that contract because of an earthquake, um, because of any other natural disaster after 9-11, terrorism was added generally to that definition. If it's because something like that, a force majeure event, the parties will not be necessarily, there's some exceptions, but in breach and be able to recover from each other. There's a massive earthquake and a band was supposed to come to the venue. They can't get there. Um, basic contract law would say there, there was an unforeseen event, a tragedy. Um, no party has recourse against the other for the obligations in the contract. So what you're seeing now is people are saying, well, what about a pandemic? That seems pretty pretty natural disaster-ish and unforeseen. Well, 
now it's foreseen. So in the beginning of COVID, the first couple of months, maybe there's been some arguments about that and those cases are not even yet through the system. But now the prevailing force majeure provision will carve out specifically pandemics in a lot of the contracts that I'm dealing with. So it basically means that if there's a spike, if you have a contract with an artist or another business and the Delta variant starts raging in the fall, um, can you get out of that contract? No obligation, no harm, no foul. The answer I can assure you is going to be no. It's because we all know that we're in the pandemic. We know that that's a possibility and you have to build that risk into your contract, maybe explicitly saying that if there's a pandemic related issue, I will pay half or we will reschedule or we will renew or we, something like that. But it's not going to get you a force majeure event. And Jeff, I'll kick it to you, but I think that's what you were kind of riffing on earlier where the coverage is not going to pay for um, a pandemic related loss. It's just kind of a riff on the same topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, if we use the the 9-11 example of um, how the insurance marketplace evolved uh, to cover terrorism events, uh, eventually it was because of uh, legislative action that took many years to achieve, uh, which created a federal backstop, which would allow insurers to uh, provide terrorism risk protection. And um, we are uh, quite a ways off from achieving the same thing. Uh, if, if that's the direction I, that I think it is, the direction we're going, uh, where there will be a legislative solution for um, that will allow for coverage to be provided by insurers with respect to pandemics, communicable diseases, and um, uh, specifically COVID-19, uh, you know, just in the moment. Um, really to echo uh, a bit of what Greg was saying, you know, in, in my world, even when an issue is insurable, um, to manage that risk as effectively as we can, we uh, very often um, use the concept known as contractual risk transfer. And really what we're saying there is that uh, if there are any legal means, contractual means to limit your exposure, uh, Greg said, sure, if, if, if force majeure is not going to be a remedy, Maybe there are other, uh, there's other wording that can be built into the contract to limit the exposure in the event. Uh, in his exam example, the Delta variant rages and, and uh, an engagement has to be called off. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think that from a risk management perspective on this particular topic, um, that is the best technique that um, artists have available to them and venues have available to them uh, to try to limit their uh, each of their respective exposures uh, to something that, um, although we'd all like to believe it's over, is not yet over. Uh, the pandemic is still here um, and uh, there is still spread of the virus and the Delta variant is likely not the last variant. And so we'll be dealing with this for quite a while uh, and until there is an insurance-based solution that people can rely upon, um, it will be the strength of the contracts they have between the parties that will be uh, the protection that they, uh, that they have and can use. And, and just to give you the buzzword real quick, that was Jeff made a great point um, on you know, reducing your risk. You know, if you want to look for these provisions in your contracts and then reach out to Ryan, he can, he can get someone to help you. So the one it usually is called force majeure. By the way, these, these are very important provisions. And as you would expect, they're buried usually in the back of the contract. Like after you're done reading, they're always like the last two pages. But so look for the force majeure. And then the other one that Jeff mentions, see if your contract has, I think Jeff, and the way I would normally see it is a mitigation clause yeah. um, in a contract where you have the obligation to mitigate your damages. So you can't just incur a loss and just say, look to the insurance company. You actually or look to the other party to cover it if it's not insured. You have the, you know, the absolute affirmative obligation to mitigate your damages if that provision's in there. So um, 
that can apply in all different scenarios, but just be mindful of that if you um, are experiencing a pandemic related loss, you, you will be, you know, for example, if, if there's a couple employees, I'll try to give an illustration, I guess, a couple employees that have gotten sick um, and you wanna sue another party or you wanna sue or try to get insurance coverage, you can't just stay open. You, you might need to close and you might need to go through an evaluation of should I reopen? Is this more? So you gotta be thinking about um, kind of curtailing and mitigating your risk if you have that obligation in the way back of your contract. So you should check that out. It's a good point, Jeff. And, and by the way, just to add, um, um, or to extend the comment that I made earlier about this is the time to reevaluate the insurance contracts that you have and, and whether they appropriately address the risk that we face today. Uh, I, I imagine, Greg, you would agree, this is absolutely the time to revisit contracts and agreements that you have been using customarily, uh, perhaps without much change or revision over the years. Uh, we are in new territory now, uh, and uh, those contracts uh, should be uh, reevaluated and strengthened where possible. Absolutely. Definitely, everyone should call Jeff about their insurance <laughs> needs after this call. I agree with that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I think those were all of the questions that I had prepared. I know we went a little over the allotted time, but some really great answers, some great information for folks on the call. So I want to thank Sarah, Greg, Jeff, all of you for the really thoughtful and in-depth responses that you guys were giving. Hopefully everybody can walk away with some you know, good information to take back to their board members or their staff members. Um, and I want to turn things back over to Tom, who, as I mentioned, has been collecting and, and gathering questions from the chat so we can spend a little bit more time just addressing those questions as needed. Um, so Tom, whenever you're ready, take it away. Sure, so um, certainly a lot of questions related to vaccination status um, and, uh, but at least one that I thought it might be nice to change gears around um, and I'll just uh, ask these questions word for word as they were presented in the chat. Um, Bill Rhodes asked, um, can we discuss standard practice for content reuse lic licensing if such a thing exists? Many of us have produced videos for streaming and would like to present this content in the future, which I thought was a nice change of gears. I guess I can speak to the fact that, you know, when these are the intellectual property um, considerations that should have been set out in the agreements with, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're speaking about this as work done for, you know, and, and something like a work for hire um, situation or um, even just getting rights from all the participants in, uh, in productions uh, you've put together, but you know the Barnes, for instance, did an enormous amount of uh, online content. Things we normally would have presented live, we instead presented online. So uh, you know, in advance of doing those, we usually gave people releases, said specifically we were going to record, set out uses for which we could do it. If we were the ones recording it, we also we hold the copyright, so we were getting right of publicity and, um, and privacy releases from the participants. Other times we work with someone else and they're producing the content, you know, and there'll be provisions in there about who can use it and who cannot use it. Often it's quite important to the uh, original commissioner of the work that, the, uh, that others don't use it. Um, you know, we tend to require that anyone doing work for us can only use that content for portfolio purposes and can't use it publicly. So I'd look back to the contracts or, um, you know, recontact the people involved and make sure you got the right settled. I will add that this is uh, an insurable issue. Um, I work with a quite a number of production companies and the greatest risk that they face, in my opinion, uh, is uh, what happens when 
um, their content, their production, their matter is disseminated to members of the public uh, and viewed or heard uh, and the response is an allegation of a rights infringement. Um, once again, this is an insurable issue. Um, another opportunity for, for those in the position of having acquired content they'd like to reuse or, or produce content uh, to make sure that their insurance contracts are adequately addressing uh, the particular exposure of the allegation of a rights infringement by a third party uh, who has been in receipt of the matter that's been disseminated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions here um, from Julie and from Kate, um, sort of asking about requiring um, um, vaccinations and uh, providing proof of vaccination for um, volunteers. Uh, as well as um, program participants, so folks who may have signed up to take a class or you know attend a workshop at your your space. I can jump in on that one. Um, the first one I, I think is pretty straightforward. The second one I just would confirm, and I don't know if you can, Tom, but I, I mean those seem to me sound like patrons or, or customers. I, I don't know if the sole purpose of the of the workshop is just what they do, but it sounds like outside folks that are not employed contractors, employees, interns of the organization, so just kind of third parties. Um, I, I think for the volunteer, um, I would consider volunteers um, exactly the same as employees and um, contractors and, and interns. Um, the law is shifting around on that. A lot of the law is shifting around on that in terms of payment, um, non-paid volunteers, um, you know, with payroll taxes and things of that nature and, and obligations to those folks, which I don't want to get into, but for your volunteers, I would treat them just like your staff. Um, if, if you're requiring vaccinations, you should require vaccinations of your volunteers. If you have a mask mandate for your staff, it should apply to the volunteers as well. Um, I would think of the workshop attendees just similar to someone that's attending a concert or an event. Um, so any policies that you have that extend to um, those sorts of events, I think you would, uh, you know, extend those to people participating in, in a workshop voluntarily or um, so but those are my thoughts on that. I don't know, um, Sarah, if you have volunteers at the barns or anything, if that's germane. Uh, yes, for, for us, we have um, consistent policies. Uh, you know, when, when we were keeping numbers down in the building, we were, uh, we did have a, volunteers were not coming in for a period of time. So, I mean, I think you can set some distinctions there about, you know, it, it's when it's not time, <laughs> but if people are working in the same conditions, it should be, uh, the rules should be applicable to all. Um, for the, um, the idea of people doing um, activities where they're gonna be in close contact with others and whether that would be a reason to have uh, mandates that you don't have in, you know, if you're normally classroom learning, uh, but then sometimes you're doing hands-on dance workshops, you know, may maybe there are reasons to have different rules for different aspects of the work. Um, a lot of us are obviously keeping, you know, on-site activities and workshops or, or restarting those while continuing virtual versions or figuring out how we can do hybrid for those who are not willing or comfortable to come back. So that, that can be a different way of addressing the different risk, you know, perhaps deciding it's not the time yet to do the close contact activities in person um, and just wait on that. But those would be business decisions. Thank you. Um, our question from Scott, and this, is, this feels a little bit more like um, best practices really. Um, would you recommend continuing to use a health tracker app that logs temperature and symptom screening for employees, faculty, artists?
I guess I would just go back to the general theme of if you're going to use it, you better use it consistently and you better have processes for, you know, the adverse uh, results. Um, so I, you know, I, I have, I don't have a lot of familiarity with those, those tracking tools, but um, I just think consistency, being mindful of protected classes and not discriminating. And then also just kind of having a plan in place to the extent you, you have an adverse trend or impact. Um, that's about all I can chime in on. Yeah, I just bring up, it's, it's more personal health information. So I guess the question is how much do you really want? What are you gonna do with it? And what are you doing to protect it? Um, you know, we, uh, we did create our own symptom app for people coming in, staff coming into the building during a time. And we have stopped that now because it's a lot of work to maintain. If you're collecting the information, someone ought to be looking at it because if you're collecting it and then not doing anything with it, now you've created an area of liability. So, you know, some of it's just the practicality. Have you done it? Do you have the capacity and the staff to do it and keep it up? And at the point, you're not going to do it well to stop it. Sarah, I think that's that's an excellent point. And I actually, when when you mentioned, you know, like personal health information and and the sort of need to protect that information um, for your staff members, I, I had sort of a follow up question that I have just thought of. Um, what do you do? In like, what, what should an employer do in a situation where maybe a staff member is asking about other staff members and asking about their vaccination status, right? Like, what, how should an employer handle that request? Um, generally, you know, just like any other health information, it's not the colleague's business <laughs> um, to, to get personal information about others. Um, it is, you know, I think some employers are going the route of collecting the information about vaccine status, doing that individually and sharing with their staff anonymous statistics, this percentage or that percentage. And I think that is, again, just the question, if you collect the information and you tell people you've got it, um, then you, are probably going to be put in a position where you have to share it. And what are you going to do if it's not perfect? Um, and you know, what is the person who's asking for it going to do with it? How has it really impacted their decision making? Um, so I think I think it's just something employers really have to think about the curiosity factor. Um, versus the actionable information. Uh, you know, people are friendly with people they work with. People are gonna have these conversations. We aren't trying to stop coworkers from asking each other about, I mean, we're not preventing it. We are in fact telling people it's personal information and you shouldn't necessarily ask. Maybe it's not polite. People have, you know, reminding people that it is personal information. Um, but there, there's a human nature factor yeah. there. So. Yeah, there's there's a nuance there that, again, I don't want to express my opinion, but it's it's really, I think we're dancing around kind of HIPAA a little bit. And um, I don't think, you know, it's, it's not a deep dive into it, but there is this nuance out there that our HIPAA experts and benefits experts are considering of the, the principal question is whether vaccination status is health information. Clearly, if you're tracking temperature, symptoms, you know, why you were on leave, what your condition was, those, those are all, those are all medical things. Whether you're vaccinated or not, um, I think, unfortunately, right now, I guess now I'm giving my opinion, unfortunately, the statutes are written that it doesn't look like whether you're vaccinated or not is necessarily a health data point that might be covered by HIPAA. So I think legislatively, they're trying to deal with that. Um, but I also just, I guess I would, if, if the question is who's been vaccinated and who's not, if, you're, if you have a stated policy that only people 
can be there if they're vaccinated, then you kind of eliminate a lot of those types of questions. But um, it's just an interesting legal question of whether vaccination status is a health condition or not. Um, that I don't know we need to get into now, but uh, it's percolating and hopefully be resolved most likely in the legislature. Excellent. Thanks both of you guys for, for answering. That was just sort of something that came up in my mind and, and I'm kind of curious to, to see how that shakes out as well, yeah. uh, Greg. Well, that, that concludes the, um, all the questions that we, uh, well, I guess there was more, one more question, Jeff, which was, um, did anybody uh, ask you for your vaccination status when you went to the Sixers game? Absolutely not. Um, and would that create a liability uh, for the Sixers or for Wells Fargo or whomever? And not Wells Fargo, but for the you know, stadium. For the, if if uh, they would what create the liability? Um, not having asked, not having asked, and then yeah, I think that's the question. I'm, yeah. I'm the I'm the I'm the super spreader. Um, I, look, I I think it. Uh, I, I don't know if, if, if the, uh, th this goes back to a lot of what we said during this discussion, if the uh, procedure of either the team or, or the venue was to ask the question, but they didn't ask it of me, uh, then I suspect there's an issue there if, if the, as was the case, if there was no procedure in place to ask the question, um, and I, I don't know that it creates any any degree of liability. I mean, that really is a legal question um, since neither is is an insurable event. But um, I, I yeah, I'm not really sure. I, uh, what what I can tell you is that um, you know they did not ask me or anybody. So I guess there was consistency at least in that. I mean, my legal response is that they, that team has other liabilities that they need to address um, on the court prior to giving more thought to the policies off the court. Enter at your own risk, and let's get some ball handlers. I think is is the answer to that question. Well, um, thank you all, and I I think that a, a few folks may be trying to um, squeeze some questions in at the end. Um, and unfortunately, we are, uh, I want to respect the time of our panelists and Ryan and really everyone else who was able to join us today. So Sarah, Jeff, Greg, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I think that this is um, that you're able to provide this level of expertise and insight to um, Cultural Alliance members as well as just members of the cultural community is really huge. So thank you so much. Um, uh, and also, you know, on behalf of the Cultural Alliance, thank you so much. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, plug one last time um, that we, uh, the Cultural Alliance is, um, you know, inviting interested folks to join our arts marketing collaborative, and I'll send out some information to registrants um, afterwards. Also, this event has been recorded, and it will be available for free um, on philoculture.org. Um, and uh, we can also send out a link to folks who registered um, who, who would like to be able to access it if you had to um, you know, arrive late or leave early. Um, and uh, of course, if anyone does have questions that um, you know, might be relevant to folks at uh, Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, um, you can reach out to me and I can help connect those dots. Um, but they are online and you can reach them that way as well. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Tom. Great. Everyone have a great afternoon and stay safe, stay cool. You too. Take care. <laughs>